Okay, so I would like to thank uh, organizers uh, for inviting me. And uh, I will report uh, some partial progress uh, on the problem of calculating four-point scattering amplitude in planar n equals four super young mills. So uh, the punchline of the talk is that, uh, as I will also review in the first few slides, we have very nice uh, reformulation of problem of calculating scattering amplitudes in planar n equals four. But now there is also a question if uh, the principles are simple for calculating amplitudes, but uh, are the actual results for the amplitude simple? So can we, is there any, is there any hope of uh, writing the exact results for scattering amplitudes, at least in planar n equals four to all loop orders or not? So uh, the natural way how to start to attack this problem is to look at the simplest possible amplitude, which is the four point amplitude. Uh, I don't have an answer to this question, but I will give some evidence uh, that uh, this question might have a positive answer in the end. Yeah? It still might be the case that it doesn't have, but uh, there is some evidence that uh, despite the problem seems to be infinitely complicated, as I will show, uh, it's possible that uh, this infinity can be captured in some finite expression. <laughs> okay, so this is... Uh, so I'm trying to push this uh, problem on uh, parallel fronts. So uh, uh, there was a paper we published with NEMA in, in late December. Uh, I will briefly talk about. There is a parallel work with uh, a group of, group of people from Darham with Sebastian Franco, Daniel Galloni, and Alberto Mariotti. And there is also something I'm trying to do by my own. So the object of interest uh, is uh, scattering amplitudes in planar n equals four super young mills. In recent number of years, there was a huge progress in understanding amplitudes, both at weak and strong coupling. And there are many new methods and uh, discoveries uh, in this field. There is just a small subset of them here on the slide. I will focus on the last one that uh, me and my collaborators uh, pushed uh, uh, over the last uh, number of years. Uh, in, uh, for n equals four super young, uh, n equals four super young mills in planar limit, we know that the theory is integrable. So that's also the hope why we might believe that uh, the amplitudes in this theory can be exactly solvable. Now there is a long list of people involved in all these discoveries, but in order not to forget anybody, I will not mention anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now the amplitude uh, in this theory is labeled usually by three indices, n, k, and l, and uh, labels the number of particles. k is the SU4 R charge. Uh, in the gluonic sector, it corresponds to the number of negative helicity uh, gluons, and l is the number of loops. So uh, first, uh, I, I would like to define the object, uh, which is uh, called integrant uh, for obvious reasons. It's a rational function uh, that you can think about as a sum of all diagrams prior to integration. This is a well-defined operation in planar limit. In beyond the planar limit, uh, this function still exists, but it's not unique. But in the planar, planar limit, it's unique. You can somehow, uh, uh, you can define the global loop momenta for all or Feynman diagrams that you have, and you can sum them prior to integration. So this is an object of my interest. Uh, there are other methods uh, in, the, in the field that are trying to avoid uh, this separation and try to calculate this function directly. I am focusing in this rational function because it has very nice properties and it might also tell us if we want to attack the problem of the integrated amplitudes, uh, what would be the guy, how to do it in this line of logic. Now, uh, this function is a rational function and it's completely fixed by its singularities. So. Uh, if you satisfy some list of constraints on this function, which basically means how the func where, where are the poles of this function and how does the function must behave on the poles, you fix it completely. From the physics point of view, it's the property of locality of the amplitude and unitarity. So uh, there is a purely geometric definition of this object, that, which doesn't rely on the field theory at all. It's just ad hoc construction from geometry, which gives exactly the same answer, exactly the same function as the sum of Feynman diagrams. So I will briefly say uh, something about this concept, amplitohedron. There is also a strong evidence, not a proof or any explicit example so far, but it's strong evidence that uh, similar structures that we see in planar n equals four here 
uh, also extend to integrated amplitudes and also beyond the planar limit. It's not clear in which exact form they would extend, but uh, there are pieces of evidence uh, that we can see the similar structure also beyond that. But I will not talk about these things. Here. So uh, the concept of amplitohedron starts uh, with, uh, with uh, the discovery of, uh, positive, of the relation between positive Grassmannian on-shell diagrams and scattering amplitudes. So I think Nima referred about that uh, in 2012 at Strings and many different conferences. So I will just briefly review it on two slides. Uh, in uh, in, perturb in uh, perturbative, uh, the perturbative series for amplitudes in planar n equals 4, uh, the series can be reformulated using completely different objects that are Feynman diagrams or any kind of reshuffling of Feynman diagrams, but conceptually new objects. These objects are con called on-shell diagrams. They look naively similar to Feynman diagrams, but they are very different. The vertices of these objects are physical three-point amplitudes, on-shell three-point amplitudes, and they are glued together by on-shell conditions. So all the lines, both internal and external, are on-shell. So this, by this diagram, looks like one-loop diagram. In fact, it's a four-point three-level amplitude. So this is a set of objects. You just take these two elementary building blocks. You start to glue them together. You get different type of diagrams. And there exist recursion relations. It's actually BCFW recursion relations for tree level and its generalization to loops, which tell you which particular combination of these graphs you have to take in order to reproduce the amplitude. So the tree level amplitude and the integrand of the loop amplitude. Now, uh, there, are, there is a one interesting feature about these diagrams is that the Youngian symmetry in planar n equals four super Young mills is completely manifest term by term in these diagrams. The thing which is not manifest is the locality in space-time. So uh, in the context of the expressions that are behind these diagrams, the poles that you would get in the functions for these diagrams are not p-square, unlike in Feynman diagrams where all the poles are p-square. So only the sum, which corresponds to the amplitude, uh, only in the sum these, all the poles cancel. And it's the same as spurious poles cancellation in BCFW recursion relations. It's exactly the same thing. Now, there is a direct relation between these diagrams on one side, which have, n which have nice physical interpretation, and uh, the positive Grassmannian. So let me just briefly tell you what is positive Grassmannian. It's extremely simple mathematical object. You take k by n matrix modulo GLK. So you describe a k-plane in n dimensions. And you say that in this matrix, all, all maximal minors, k by k minors, must be positive. So you they are directly in the real Grassmannian. All the entries are real. And in addition, these minors must be positive. Now, if you start with the top cell of this Grassmannian, which means that all the entries are generic, modulo GLK, no minors vanish, then you get a top cell. And then from this top cell, you can stratify this space, which means that you set some of these minors to 0. You can easily see that the only minors you can actually send to 0 are the ones where the labels, uh, uh, where the labels uh, are, uh, are, it, oh, sorry. are uh, the minors that correspond in, in a geometric picture to setting, uh, to setting particular point, consecutive points on some geometric objects. Now, for each cell of dimensionality d, so suppose that we take this matrix, we set a bunch of minors to 0, we land on a d-dimensional cell, which means that there are still d three parameters, we can, uh, we can find the positive coordinates. So we just uh, find the parametrization of this matrix such that all the minors are manifestly positive in these coordinates. And then we can associate a logarithmic form. So that's what we do. We associate a logarithmic form with such a, with such a matrix, which is just dx over x for all these parameters. Now, this logarithmic form evaluated using particular delta function exactly reproduces the function behind these on-shell diagrams. So there is a correspondence between these diagrams, between the, between the cell and the cell in the positive Grassmannian, and there is a simple logarithmic form associated with the cell and reproduces the, the function of kinematics that we would get from on-shell diagrams. Now, uh, so there is, uh, so this is, this is very good. So now the problem of uh, calculating 
Scattering amplitudes is uh, reformulated in the new basis of objects, which make different things manifest than the usual Feynman diagrams. But now the idea, the farther idea is, uh, can we, in some sense, these diagrams that correspond to a given amplitude glue together in one object? Can we define the amplitude as a single object rather than an uh, expansion in terms of some building blocks? And this is uh, what led to this concept of Amplitohedron, which is just a, just a generalization of the positive Grassmannian. For the three level amplitudes, it's, uh, uh, strictly speaking, it's a map from the top cell of the positive Grassmannian to some smaller Grassmannian. And the map is provided by metrics uh, of, uh, again, with all the minors positive, which, uh, and this metric captures all the external data. So I denoted Z, these are momentum twisters. Uh, which were also introduced in Matthias' talk, and they, they capture all the external kinematics, so all the external momenta and also uh, the Grassmann variables. Uh, so there is also a generalization for the loop integrand, which involves some new mathematical objects that ha haven't been studied in mathematicians. This map also hasn't been studied by mathematicians, but uh, uh, if we go to the loop integrand, even before we are mapping this positive Grassmannian down, this also involves new objects, and uh, well, I, I will not have time to go there in details, but basically uh, we start with this C matrix, which corresponds to the three level case, and we are adding a bunch of two by n matrices, each of them for one loop variable. And then the demand that certain combination of them are also correspond to matrices with all maximum minors positive. And then we do this Z map. So this is a purely formal definition. Uh, I just wanted to put it into the context, but for the case of the four-point amplitudes, it actually boils down to very simple, very simple relation that can be written on one line. Now, a uh, few more comments. Uh, the amplitude, the, the actual function for the amplitude uh, corresponds to the space, but in fact, it's given by the form with logarithmic singularities on boundaries of this space. So I define this space on, uh, on these few lines, and I define a form which has logarithmic singularities. The logarithmic singularities, uh, uh, you can think about it as a form when if the boundary is characterized by some, some parameter x uh, that goes to 0 on boundary, the form must behave like dx over x times some form that doesn't depend on x. Now, this form is purely bosonic, but we can extract the supersymmetric amplitude from it. So that was also uh, hidden in the original definition that uh, despite our external word is four dimensional and we want to stick in four dimensions as uh, also Matthias pointed out. Now uh, the object really lives in four plus K dimension and these K dimension, K, uh, four plus K bosonic dimension are there to capture the supersymmetric data. And then there is some sim simple algebraic procedure how to extract supersymmetric data in four dimensions out of four plus k dimensional bosonic form. Now, uh, so we have a nice definition, but uh, the hard problem is to calculate this form. Uh, there are two different strategies uh, how, which you can proceed. The first one is try to fix, it, fix the form directly from definition. You can easily show that uh, the form is uniquely defined by just saying that it has logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of the space. It's uniquely defined. There, it's not clear how to, how to fix it directly, but uh, it's a unique form. Now, the other, uh, the other way uh, how to proceed is try to triangulate the space to some, as a sum of some smaller pieces, and then uh, write the form for these smaller pieces and sum all of them. For these smaller pieces, uh, the form is, again, just the trivial d log form. So it's just dx over x for all the variables that parameterize this one small piece. Once we proceed this, uh, uh, this line of thought, uh, then in the end, actually, the on-shell diagrams via the BCFW recursion relations exactly gives a triangulation of this type. Yeah? There also exist different triangulations, which uh, naively don't look like uh, something that comes from the BCFW recursion relations. We are not sure. Maybe they are there. But, so, but the BCF, but BCFW gives, uh, gives the expansion of the amplitude of this type. Now let me talk now about four-point amplitude. So this, is, this was fairly general, what I said before, but now we focus on four-point amplitudes because they are the simplest ones in, in, this, uh, in this theory. 
Now, if you, if you try to calculate the four-point amplitudes using Feynman diagrams, you easily, at, at not so higher number of loops, you reach the number of Feynman diagrams, which is more than, uh, more than atoms in the universe. So it's not the right way how to do it, especially if you want to do some all-loop all -loop calculation. But there is a clever, there is a smarter way how to do it, and it's to find some basis of scalar and tensor integrals, not directly Feynman diagrams, and expand the amplitude in this basis. So uh, this, uh, this, uh, this procedure has a long history, started uh, by one loop calculation by Brin, Green, and Schwartz in 1982, and goes down to the six and seven loop calculation by Jacob Bruchai Lee, uh, Mark Spradley, Nastya Wolovich, and uh, their students in 2011. Uh, so these were very impressive calculations. Uh, the number of diagrams grows. Uh, this is just number of topologies that you, uh, that you get. There are also permutations of these diagram in all the loop variables and cyclic permutations in external legs. So if you take the seven loop result, uh, it's already several millions of terms if you just fully expand it. Unfortunately, there hasn't been seen any simplification in, uh, in these diagrams. So it just grows. Yeah, it, of course, it grows much slower than Feynman diagrams, but it seems that there is no pattern how to capture this series in any way. But there is another piece of information we know, and it's from the integrated amplitude. So now if you take these amplitudes integrate them, we have the BDS ansatz, which tells us that for MHV amplitudes, the integrated amplitude in dimensional regularizations exponentiates up to some unknown functions of coupling. Yeah, so this is the original BDS ansatz. Uh, for, a, for a number of particles bigger than five, there is some correction, so, so call, uh, called, uh, uh, called remainder function. But for four-point amplitudes, it's perfectly, it's, uh, perfectly valid. And uh, it just shows that the L-loop amplitude is uh, exponent of one-loop amplitude with some unknown functions of coupling. So these Fs are unknown functions. Uh, there is... Uh, there is a very interesting fact that one of these unknown functions of coupling actually shows up in totally different contexts in integrability. And uh, it's known as gamma cusp. And it was calculated uh, by Weizert, uh, Eden, and Matthias Staudach in 2006. There was written an integral equation which can be solved order by order to arbitrary, arbitrary degree. And we can find the explicit solution. Unfortunately, so far, the other functions of coupling that show up in this expression uh, as far as I know, hasn't been evaluated to all loops. But there are results for, partic for some given number of loops. So, uh, okay. so there is... Uh, but, uh, well, I don't know if you know these functions of coupling. Yeah. So... Yeah, well, if I just fully like expand it, yeah, yeah in so epsilon. Correct, if I remember correctly, in massive regularization, you don't get these issues. Because you get logs of the mass and then powers of the mass. When you expand it, only to each other, you don't get about positive powers of the mass. And then you only need about the leading order ones that are governed by the cut sum. Yeah, but, well, I would like to like evaluate the full amplitude, yeah. So, uh, well, I don't think that, well, the thing is, it's not clear the dimensional regularization is the, right way how to proceed in this picture, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, well, I, I was just write the BDS, I just wrote the BDS ansatz for that. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to illustrate, well, I, I, I wanted to actually illustrate the other thing. I wanted to illustrate that the integrated amplitudes have the simple form. They have some unknown functions, but that the form is very simple. Something which is not visible at the level of integrand so far. Yeah. So there is the, the this is the tension that, uh, it seems that the integrand, if you go to infinite L, it just starts to grow, and there is, uh, there is no way how to, there is no sign of simplification. But we know that it integrates to relatively simply expressions up to, up to these unknown functions of coupling, because uh, even the gamma cusp, we cannot, we cannot think about it as a known function, because we stole it from Matthias and integrability, and we would like to derive it. That would be, that would be the point. Uh, so the ultimate goal would be to take, uh, take uh, the amplitude hedron definition for the integrand, 
first try to understand the stratification and the topological properties of the space. It was very important for the positive Grassmannian to understand the topological properties and how the space looks like. Now, try, try it, uh, to find a form with logarithmic singularities to all loops in closed form. That would be the best case scenario. And if we can do it, uh, then try to, ex uh, try to extract uh, the BES equation or to find some kind of map from uh, the integrand down to the integrated expressions. Yeah, rather than to integrate, it seems that if we directly integrate it in any known regularization, it's somehow, it's a very complicated process that hides the simplicity on both sides. Now, uh, so the definition of the amplitohedron in the form point case is extremely simple. We start with four L positive real variables, and they satisfy uh, uh, quadratic conditions. So the variables are indices uh, index i from 1 to L, and now if we take two different indices, they must satisfy this quadratic relation. And the amplitude is then formed with logarithmic singularities on the space defined by just these two lines. In the special case of four point, the z-mat I was talking about earlier doesn't play any role. It's complete, it's, uh, it doesn't depend on it. Therefore, it's much simpler. Now, for one loop, the situation is extremely trivial. We just have four positive variables, and we would like to find the form with logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of this space. But uh, the boundaries are zero at infinity for all four variables. So the form is just dx over x, dy over y, dz over z, dw over w. That's all. Now, if you, you can go back from these variables and solve for kinematical variables, and then it uh, leads, uh, this is in momentum twister space, this is in momentum space to the known formula for the zero mass box that we know that captures the one loop amplitude in this theory. Now, for two loop, uh, we have two sets of these variables together with a single quadratic condition. Uh, now, the form, must, uh, ha the, the, the form that we are looking for uh, has uh, this particular structure. It has eight poles in the denominator correspond to these eight variables, and the extra quadratic pole correspond to setting this equation to zero. So it's an eight form with nine poles, so there is some non-trivial numerator here. So there are two strategies how to proceed. The first one is expand, expand this object as a sum of objects with only eight poles, because then it's just, logarith it's just directly the logarithmic form if we have eight poles. And uh, the other way would be to fix the numerator directly. Ah. So let me discuss the second way. So the fixing the numerator directly, we can do it from listing the constraints that uh, the definition uh, puts on the numerator. So one of the constraints was uh, having logarithmic singularities uh, in general. So so in the expression I had before, if I set two of the variables to zero, I produce a double pole in x. So the numerator must be proportional to x in this limit. The other type of constraint is that after setting some variables to zero, I start to violate uh, the, the positivity condition. So after setting these four, four things to zero, I get the sum of po two positive terms is negative. So again, the numerator must vanish. Now, uh, in this case, these, uh, in this simple two-loop case, these, cause, these simple conditions completely fix the numerator, and it has this form up to overall function of coupling. And actually, these four terms correspond to the expansion of uh, the two-loop amplitude in terms of four double boxes. So the result known in the literature. There is an interesting uh, thing, uh, even here, for the two-loop, there is some interesting non-trivial topology of the space. In case of the positive Grassmannian, the topology of the space, uh, uh, the space is topologically a ball, so the Euler characteristic is one. And it's a very non-trivial property of the space. The one loop amplitude has the, is just a positive Grassmannian G24. So if we now count number of boundaries, the four dimensional one and so on, and now we take the alternating sum, we get an Euler characteristic again one, as was, as was proved in the case of positive Grassmannian. For the two-loop case, we are beyond the positive Grassmannian, so we can list all the boundaries and just count the numbers and to see what happens. And the Euler characteristic is two. So there is some non-trivial topology yeah, starting in two loops. And, uh, and Daniel Galone uh, did some impressive calculation for three and four loops where the number of boundaries is extremely huge, and it seems that uh, this feature holds even at higher loops. And the non-trivial topology is probably closely related to the non-trivial numerator in this, uh, in this form. Now, uh, let me define the problem at uh, L loops. So uh, 
at L loops, we have four L of these variables. So we have pairwise these quadratic conditions. So the form must look like that. Uh, so we have all these simple poles and then these quadratic poles. And now if we want to fix the numerator, we would like to fix the numerator directly. But so far, it's too hard. We can definitely write a lot of constraints on the numerator, but it's not clear how to organize them to infinite L. But there are two uh, particular calculations we can do, or even now, which is first, uh, don't look at this form directly, but look at uh, certain residues of this form, which in the physics language would correspond to the cuts of the amplitude. Or there is a purely mathematical simplification, which is considered a smaller set of these conditions. So it doesn't correspond to any physical amplitude, but mathematically it's perfectly justified. Just a toy model for, for, for this problem. So uh, the cuts of the amplitude was something that, uh, uh, that uh, we discussed in the paper with Nima. And there is just one example. If we set all the z variables to 0, then the quadratic condition factorizes into the product of linear conditions. And this is exactly the case, which is completely solvable, very trivially. And we can write the form to all loops. And it corresponds to some cuts of the amplitude to all loops. Uh, so uh, uh, the, other, the other situation, uh, the other case that it's solvable corresponds just uh, to considering the full condition. So we don't set anything to 0. But we say that uh, not all, th we don't impose all quadratic conditions, but just the ones between adjacent labels. So we basically order our loop variables and then consider positivity conditions just among them. So it doesn't correspond to any physical amplitude, but it's just a simplification of the full problem. And then in this case, uh, it's, it's actually possible to list all the conditions from the logarithmic singularities and solve the numerator exactly to all loops. And well, I just made a sketch of how the results look like. There is some kind of exponentiation of uh, the two loop result. And then there is some remainder, which I can actually show that integrates to some finite piece after integration. So there must be some simpler BES equation for this problem, I hope. So now let me just go to the conclusion. So the problem of calculating the integrant of four point amplitudes in plane where equals n equals four super young nose, we can formulate in this geometric language of amplitohedron. We can easily define the problem, but the solution seems to all loop order is very hard at the moment, but uh, I showed some partial result. And there must be some close relation between the topology of the space and the non-triviality of the form, because in the positive Grassmannian case, the form was trivial. It was just D log form of all variables, and the topology of the space was trivial. Here, there is some non-triviality uh, in this case. And the four-point amplitudes are, is an ideal test case. Uh, if the full perturbative expression for amplitudes can be solved exactly, we should see it uh, here, or there is no hope on believing that uh, there is any closed form for amplitudes at all. And I will, I will end with some artistic visualization of amplitude. <laughs> Thank you.